I would like to uh, quote Vin, actually. I, I earmarked here a section of the book because, uh, and, and this is before knowing that Vin had passed away, but I felt very important to, to express this to the listeners, um, what he thought as far as your role, Fred, and where you were in life. Uh, it was at the end of the chapter one, don't want to ruin it for people, but he put in, it was almost as if God said, you are not working with the Dodgers, but you can be inspirational to millions of people. That's your job now. Those who know about him, who come into contact with him, this being Fred, who hear about what he's on earth for now, realize he's been given a job that is a heck of a lot more important and bigger in stature than being the general manager of a baseball team. And talking with Steve, the book idea of extra innings, you know, people picking it up, not sure, is this a baseball book? Is this a life book? Is this a book about health and survival? It's a bit of everything, certainly. But a lot of people have gone through things in life, health scares, loss of loved ones. You re- I have to tell the listeners, you really have to pick up this book and read it to truly understand what Fred has gone through and what Fred is trying to bring out to this world. I myself, I'm not going to say I was skeptical, but I said, Fred has been through so much through 30 years with the Dodgers. Why is he so devoted to this one center? Why is he made it his life mission to talk about this center for the rest of his life? What, what, is, what is so big about this place? Because I didn't know enough about it. And reading it through it, you know, tears flow, conversations immediately come to had, you know, friends and family about all of us that have been touched by cancer, either directly or indirectly, what's out there. And, and, and Fred, you're a living miracle you know, having experienced so many lifetimes, but yet at your age and in your 80s to be able to fight what a lot of people can't fight in their 40s and 50s, you know, hats off to you and making your life mission now to spread the word to help others. Well, it was so nice of uh, of Vinny to to use those uh, words. And and I I feel uh, what... um, Vinny uh, had to say in terms of uh, my mission, and Steve probably knows the wonderful Kevin Towers, and Jonathan, you point out in the book that my friendship with, uh, with Kevin and, uh, and uh, his widow now, uh, Kelly. Uh, but uh, when, you, uh, when you have the good fortune to um, be close to someone like Vin. And I exchanged a text message with Annie Drysdale, a uh, dear friend of, of uh, Bob Euchre, Don with, and, and, uh, and Annie. And she texted me the night that Vinny passed. And I texted uh, Annie back. And uh, I said to her that uh, with the passing of Vin, we now have a, uh, a greater obligation that uh, the world has lost a man of uh, great kindness. So as teammates, uh, we have to uh, pick that up and carry on. And so that's the way that I uh, feel about it. I, uh, when I saw City of Hope and what they did, uh, I wanted to help. And uh, it's in the book, but um, I went to the city or asked to meet with the city of Hope person and said that uh, I see what's happening here and I think that I can help. Uh, I said, I think with the help of some friends that we can raise some money. I'd never thought about a celebrity golf tournament with a celebrity golf tournament. And um, the person walked away and my wonderful Cheryl said to me, you've... uh, you got to be the only person here with a 20% chance of survival playing a golf tournament. And I thought, well, <laughs> I like golf. <laughs> so we'll give, a, well, we'll give it a try. Uh, representatives of every world champion team, the support uh, from uh, the Dodger players, friends in baseball, uh, so meaningful. Uh, and we raised a half million dollars uh, for City of Hope. And the second tournament, uh, uh, because actually, uh, and Steve, I don't know how well you knew Kevin, uh, but uh, 
when I went to Kevin's memorial service in San Diego, uh, I hadn't uh, met uh, Kelly Towers. And I knew that uh, Kirk and his wife were very close to Kevin. And so I went down and uh, uh, visited with uh, uh, Kirk and his, his wife and, and said that I wanted to meet Kelly. And they said, well, we'll introduce you. I said, no, I, I will go down and introduce myself. Uh, Kevin fought a terrible battle with anaplastic thyroid cancer. It's, it's an unbeatable opponent, unbeatable. And uh, so I told Kelly that, uh, introduced myself, told her I was this, going to have the second golf tournament and was going to ask or, or designate half the funds that came in on that tournament in addition to head and neck to go to anaplastic thyroid cancer. And the wonderful Kelly said, Fred, um, I, uh, I don't know anything about golf, but I will be at your tournament. And so she uh, uh, came to the tournament. What was it what's not known? As she told me later that when she was driving there, uh, she got a call from Theo Epstein, a good friend uh, of Kevin's. And uh, Theo was a young guy, didn't really know him that well. And he said, what are you doing? She said, I'm driving to Fred's golf room. She said, he said, I wanna make a contribution. I say that for one reason which I'm trying to be a part of. That is baseball coming together. So many people in our game, so many people in life, but so many people in our game have been lost to cancer, a lot of time in the sun uh, and, and not taking the precautions that are needed. So I look upon this again, not as an individual effort, because it can't happen that way. But, but it, is my, uh, it is my passion now. It is my most important role that I will have. And I will have until my final breath is, uh, is doing what I can to um, help fight cancer. Well, I'm going to share a, a bit of a uh, personal experience, but I think this will really help the listeners understand the meaning of this book and how important it is. Uh, again, extra innings. Um, for myself, uh, I know you have a journalist background, Fred, before you came in to be a baseball executive, and I was a writer for some time as well as being a lawyer. I had writer's block for close to 10 years. I just, I could not write for whatever reason. I decided I'm going to go live life. I don't want to write about it. And I also had reader's block. As a kid, I used to read a book a day. I used to go to the library, get seven books, read one a day, be done with it. I had, my parents drilled it into me. They're immigrant parents. They said, you read, you read, you read, you read. So I would read the, that book a day forever. And I developed also reader's block because I said, I read so much as a lawyer, I can't read. I have not been able to finish a book in close to 10 years. Like I've tried many, many times. This is the first book in 10 oh, years God. that I have read from cover to cover. I read it in three days. And I don't want people to have a misconception. This is not a pure baseball book. This is not a pure cancer book. This is for anybody, I don't care if you're 16 or you're 90, if you want to read about what it is to be a good person, to work hard, to succeed in life, to be good to others, to learn about trials and tribulations, there's a bit of everything in there. I think anybody could enjoy it, will enjoy it. They'll think of their own experiences. They'll think about other people close to them. But first and foremost, I can tell you, Fred, when I was reading it, I looked into the, my into the mirror and I said to myself, are you being the best person you can be right now? What are you doing for others? What are you doing and thinking of others? Because we, you're, you're so right. And we all get wrapped up into our own lives and think about number one, like you said, but really what can we do to help others? And that's where, when I really understood your journey and Steve, were I talking about everything you've been through the city of hope, it starts to think, let's give back to others. Let's think about being better human, human beings on this planet and looking after each other because that's sorely lacking, unfortunately, in our society. And everybody picked up this book, I think we'll see that direction. Well, Jonathan, your, your words really mean a, a great deal. I, I consider that a, a, a tremendous uh, compliment to- uh, They're still the calling in for trades, by the way, but they don't realize- That's what I was thinking. Yeah. They, the, the, the trade deadline's over. I mean, he's got to get off of it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I-, I uh, Mookie Betts is not on the table. Uh, yeah, I, I, I remember, <laughs> I, I, I remember a, a few of those. Uh, uh, with uh, wonderful memories of uh, a few of those, including trading, Steve. 
when I saw your background, I'm sure you knew him, one of the finest people that I had the uh, opportunity to bring to the Dodgers was Tim Belcher. Did you work with Tim with uh, Cleveland? I Day? worked with Tim with, yes, I did. And Tim and I still keep in touch. We text each other on occasion. And he's uh, one of he, those scouts that, you know, when he got into it, it was great. He's a fabulous man. He, he, he is a incredible human being. And that's what I say about character. Obviously, he had a great arm. He was the number one draft uh, mm -hmm. selection. But he was more than his arm. And that is what, and you know this, Steve, in your background, in coaching players and trying to get through and trying to identify who in this group is really going to succeed. That, that's, that's the part of baseball that I miss most of all. You can take the title, you can take whatever money, you can have it all. I miss more than anything being with people like Steve and talking about the game and the scouts and the player development people. And those are the people who reach out to me and probably a few calls here because so many of them have been left behind. They've been left behind. It's the human connection, right, Fred? The human yep. connection that you get and, with and you people know, on a know, daily basis. You know who had that as well as anyone was Kevin. He, he, he got straight A's because that's what that's who he was and uh, he would tell me in later years that he said Fred you won't believe it today he said these general managers don't even talk to one another they exchange text messages he says can you imagine that and I said I don't even want any part of it <laughs> so I gotta ask you Fred uh, for anybody that's ever been in a position or had been in an industry had a passion you given all of your life to baseball and you were there for decades and you continued on to the, in the game in different ways, as far as teaching, consulting, uh, creating the analytics company. But I had to know, and, and, and I asked Steve the same thing with him is when you find out that you're no longer going to be part of the organization, which we'll talk about in a moment, your phone must have been ringing off the hook when you decided to walk away from the Dodgers at that point. Uh, why the decision not to go to another team? Why not continue in the game in a different way at that point? Because, you know, we're talking 20 plus years ago. Sure, the opportunities must have been there. But where was your mind at and any regrets in that capacity? I can ask. Well, a good question, Jonathan. Uh, I think as far as the, uh, the departure, the one thing that I knew, and so I didn't have any remorse about it, uh, and I think this is important for, as players too. I knew, and it was acknowledged, I gave everything I had every single day. Everything, whatever energy you see now, it was probably 10 times that. All that I had, I gave to the Dodgers. And, uh, and actually, when, uh, when I was let go the night after coming back from Colorado. And I think it's probably in the first book, Fred Clare's 30 Years in Dodger Blue. Uh, they said, well, you can stay on and assist Tommy. Uh, that, that's like you've been the starting shortstop. But if you want to stick around, you, you can back up Derek Jeter or somebody, not to make that comparison. But uh, I, 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 I said at the press conference that I was open to opportunities, but I, I wasn't going to, um, to, uh, to make calls. I, I really felt that uh, I'm sure there were different roles. Uh, I, I do like being in charge of my life and the things that I do. And I really felt that my best role not that I couldn't have served other roles, was to have the chance to really to make a impact. And the, the only, uh, uh, there were a couple of teams that did reach out. Uh, the wonderful Sid Thrift, the dear friend, had just been fired by the Orioles and they asked him for his recommendation. He called me, he said, Fred, would you be interested in the Orioles? And I said, Sid, I would love an opportunity for the Orioles. But I said, I don't know whether they're going to take a recommendation of the guy they just fired. But if you want to put my name in, that's wonderful. <laughs> so um, I did. I wanted at that point, I wanted to move on. 
I wanted to teach. And uh, I had the opportunity at USC to start a class sports business in the media, teaching uh, youngsters and uh, met with USC. And uh, I was just coming off a high profile position with the Dodgers. They said, uh, well, Fred, we'd love to have you. This position doesn't uh, pay a lot. And I said, no, the opportunity to teach at USC would be wonderful. Well, Fred, this, this the position doesn't pay a lot. I said, look, let's handle this negotiation this way. You give me a figure and whatever that figure is, I'll say yes. And they gave me a figure and I said, wonderful. A chance to teach at USC. They called me the next day and said, Fred, you've just gotten the quickest raise in the history of USC. But that led to a career uh, involved in teaching at uh, USC, starting a sports, uh, helping with a sports uh, graduate program at Long Beach State, and then ultimately to be able to teach at uh, Caltech, the first sports class ever. So I, I went on, as much as I love the game, uh, even at my age, I, I, I kind of had the sense, Jonathan, to your question, that it, um, it was probably time to move on uh, with the satisfaction of knowing I had given my best to move on to other things. And um, my mother was battling cancer. I was able to spend time with her that no question I couldn't have spent if I was still in the role with the Dodgers, that not being the reason. But um, I just felt very fortunate to, uh, to have had the life and, and, and feel that way uh, today. You, you, can't, you can't hang on to things. Uh, Steve, with whatever he decides to do related to his career in baseball, there, as much as you love something, you have to reflect. You have to let go. I can go back and replay one of the episodes of Chosen Journey when Steve talks about his own decision to stop playing. And I could tell you verbatim when you started your, um, your, your talk of why you chose to walk away at that point, it was almost what Steve said. And that, that sense of fulfillment and it's time to go when it's time. And Steve, you know, I, I honestly, I, I'm looking out at both of you. You're almost like twins because you have the similar mindset. Yeah, you know, it. it's just one of those things, right? That you just kind of come to the end of the road and you understand there are bigger and more things that you want to accomplish in life uh, besides baseball. And, and Fred it was in the game, you know, I don't even know how many years you were in a game, Fred. I mean, 50, 50, 55, it's a long time. I, I've been in it playing and coaching for 32, and I can only imagine. But that's the journey that I decided to, to take, right, as Fred did. And at, at some point, you kind of just veer off on, on the baseball journey and, and continue on life's journey on spending more time with your parents or spending more time with your kids, spending more time with your family, and, and learning to grow in, in that aspect, you know, just listen to Fred um, talk about Tim Belcher and the great Vince Scully and others and talking early in the episode about character. Um, you know, as crazy as it sounds, Fred, I'm coaching my son's team now uh, after getting out of coaching with some of the older kids and uh, or older guys, I should say. Um, and it's a little bit different, but I have pulled up on my phone one of the phrases that I gave them to put into their binder as we be start to begin practice. Uh, and I have to read it because uh, Fred has brought it up a couple of times. And I just think it's something that everybody should hear. And, and this is what I gave them to give them a little bit of perspective, even at the age of 12, that, that you know, uh, that things as they continue in life character is a major uh, thing that you want to develop uh, as you go through school and as you go through life in general. But the, the saying goes, watch your thoughts for they become words. Watch your words for they become actions. Watch your actions for they become habits. Watch your habits for they become character. Watch your character for it becomes destiny. So I wanted the boys to understand that character is something that they need to work on and that people do look at the character that you possess 
as you get older in life and it defines a lot of who you are as a person. Very, very well said, Steve. I, I agree wholeheartedly uh, uh, in that. And uh, the opportunity to, uh, to coach and to be a part of uh, the lives of uh, young people. And as Jonathan knows from uh, reading the book, that one of the people that I met in my cancer journey was a high school baseball coach and we connected uh, totally. Uh, he had the same oncologist that uh, I did and <clears throat> he, um, he didn't survive his cancer battle. But as a high school coach, and I made the point, I, I felt as close to him uh, as I did anybody in the professional game. We're, we're all in the same uh, business here, the, the, the best in, in the world, the best sport in the world. Uh, and, and that's our great game of uh, baseball. And, and you will find too, Steve, that even though you may not be with a, a team at this point, that you, you, you want to continue those um, uh, connections with the people in the game because they're, they're lifetime uh, friendships. And uh, to, um, to be at uh, uh, Vinny's service yesterday, and getting out of the car just in front of Cheryl and I, because they had come together uh, with Oral Hershiser and his wife and the wonderful mm -hmm. Jaime Herin. And so uh, those, uh, because you lose a position or leave a position, <laughs> you don't lose the friendships and, and the uh, connections. They're there forever and they should be mm -hmm. treasured and, um, uh, because uh, I, I stay, our, our, the wonderful Mel Didier isn't with us now. Uh, Mel is so close to Toronto, as you know, uh, see. Yeah. But I, I stay in touch with his wonderful wife, Elena. Cheryl and I call Helena probably um, once every couple of weeks to see how she's doing. Uh, that, that's, um, as Vinny said, that's, that's family. They, they can fire you from the job. Uh, they're not taking your heart and your soul and your mind. Uh, I, I earned money since I was trapping muskrats and passing the Xenia Daily Gazette. <laughs> I can get a job. <laughs> uh, but to know, and Steve, with your talent, to know that you were so fortunate to spend part of your life in a game that you love is a blessing. That was Vinny, who from the age of eight had a love for the game and they gave everything that he had for 67 years and set an example wow. for, um, for all of us. And so we're, 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 we're fortunate and uh, the game um, is so meaningful and we need to stay involved and to do all that we can uh, to try to do uh, as much as we can um, to help the game uh, that has been so good to us. I have, I have such to a say, tight knit community. Yeah. And I'd say something that Steve often brings up and I'm gonna bring it into this context, but the two people sitting here with me are two of the humblest people I've ever met. One I consider a long, a long time friend, one a new friend. But uh, Steve often talks about for the amount of people on this planet that play baseball, the odds of even playing one day in the major leagues, you have a better chance of winning the lottery. <laughs> and for the amount of baseball executives out there and are involved in the game to any capacity, to be a GM for one day is next, is next to impossible. And, and you both been in the game, survived the game for so many years. And I would say a common denominator in that is definitely character, humbleness, that carried you forward in your respective positions, whether it's coaching, whether it's executive. And Fred, you talk about that in the book. I don't care if you're playing Pee Wee baseball or Major League Baseball, you are in the family and you are part of the baseball family. The two of you are baseball family, whether you haven't sat at the table together before, but you're long distance relatives, but you're there together today. Of course, of course. Now, as we sum up today, I appreciate Fred again, you know, first of all, being able to talk about Vince Scully as it's so recent and being able to share that experience, taking the time today for us. 
Uh, we talked about characters. I, I I have to sum up today with a couple more characters. Just we got to get as many stories in as we can. But two names I wanted to pass by. Number one is Mike Piazza. As far as your linkage to Mike, and as your Dodger career came to an end, uh, I've never seen anywhere. What was your relationship with Mike? Can you share a little bit about that and uh, and how that came to be? Well, I had um, a great deal of respect for Mike because um, uh, when you uh, look at Mike and his drive and desire to be the best that he, that he could be uh, is really a, uh, a magnificent story. And uh, Tommy, uh, as has been uh, properly noted, deserves a lot of respect in um, having the Dodgers draft Mike at, literally at the uh, bottom of the ladder. Uh, but Mike's willingness to go to winter ball, his willingness to go to the Dominican, his work ethic, he, he clearly had tremendous ability, uh, but Mike was willing to um, uh, pay the price to do whatever he needed to do. Uh, I remember uh, sitting at Wrigley Field with Mike's father, Vince, sitting by my side along with Cheryl when Mike got his first major league hit and, uh, and actually the end of his Dodger days uh, came, uh, or the end of my Dodger days came with the end of Mike's Dodger days because we don't have the time to get into it. But Mike was traded by a uh, Dodger executive over a television deal. And they called me and said, there needs to be an announcement tonight. Uh, we've traded Mike Piazza and you need to say you made the deal. And I said, well, then there'll be two announcements tonight. Because after I announced that Mike's been traded, I'll announce that I resigned and I never quit anything, anything. But I wasn't going to tolerate that because that was damaging, not to me, that was damaging to the Dodger organization. And uh, so, uh, but um, uh, Mike uh, deserves all of the uh, accolades. Had a nice uh, text message uh, from Mike, very meaningful. Uh, in response to my uh, sympathy for the passing of uh, his dad. And I got to ask you, how early on from meeting Mike did you realize deep down you had something special there? I, I think it was uh, pretty clear from the beginning. When you see someone uh, with that type of... Uh, a power, and as Steve well knows, a swing that was uh, both compact and explosive. And uh, I, I can recall even, of course, Mike uh, became one of our five consecutive rookies of the year. So it didn't take long to see that we had a special player. And when uh, Fox took over, and um, was concerned about the contract and um, wanted to uh, 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 ask me to explore trading Mike. I told them they were making the mistake of a lifetime. Um, but uh, it, it, was, it was obvious early on that uh, this was a special player. I am so fortunate that I'll be able to come and express some regret. And I've been waiting all these years to be, meet you so that I can tell you I'm really sorry because I had no idea when I found out about that announcement, I remember to this day, I felt like my heart was getting ripped out of my body. I wasn't a Dodger fan per se, but I'm a baseball fan and a life fan. I can't picture Mike Piazza not in Dodger blue. And I said, Fred Claire has lost his mind clearly. What the heck is going on? That was my first reaction. I was so mad at you. And then when I realized that you were no longer part of the Dodgers, I'm like, oh, okay. So I'm not out the field, but I apologize for ever questioning your judgment on that one. Uh, but, uh, it made sense as far as, uh, from your, I, I can't imagine somebody overriding, like you wrote about in the book, when somebody else steps in and does your job for you, what, why do I need to do this job anymore? I'm yeah. just a mouthpiece, right? Yeah. Then the other person, we have to finish it off today. And again, thank you for the timing, but we have to bring him Kirk Gibson, a person you're going to be linked to, to the end of time fighting his own health battles, but got to ask you the one question. Have you ever met a tougher SOB out there than Kirk Gibson? <laughs> No, and uh, I had the chance to uh, visit with Kirk yesterday, who made the trip 
from his home in Michigan to Viet Binh service. And so I was standing there after the service and um, the group was um, Oral and Sosha, myself, Mickey Hatcher and Kirk. Um, and up came a um, young man who started with the Dodgers as an intern and who's now the president of the Hall of Fame, Josh Rawlich. But they, uh, Sosh was asking about uh, going back as the famous story now of Kirk's first day in spring training uh, with the shoe black. And uh, Sosh was asking, well, what, what really happened, Fred? And I said, well, Kirk went back to the clubhouse and said, I'm leaving here today. And I want to uh, meet with the team tomorrow, tomorrow morning. And uh, he had said that to Tommy. And Tommy said, well, you know, Kirk, we, we may be able to gloss over this and say it was something else. And Kirk had the proper answer. I want to meet with the team. Uh, and uh, it was a fulfillment. And I told Kirk, I said, remember the first dinner we ever had together after I signed you. You said to me, I'll never forget his words. I may have to kick some butt around here. And I said to Sosha and Oral, he wasn't talking about you guys, but he was talking. <laughs> and I said, I replied to him, hey, why do you think you're here? And, uh, but he led, led by example, uh, led by a uh, absolute uh, competitive situation uh, of just and what he was all about and he uh, led that to the team of being the best you could be every single game and um, we uh, we had our uh, a little difference at one point where he wanted to be traded and we had quite a uh, discussion ended up in the um, I, I, and the, after the all-star game and the clubs, uh, the old clubhouse sitting back there on the Coca-Cola cartons. And um, I told him, I said, Kirk, he said, I said, um, it's a good thing you've got a mild mannered agent, Doug Baldwin, because you've got a hell of a temper. And he said, Fred, don't tell me about my temper. When you put your glasses on top of your head and got in my face, do not tell me about my temper. And he says, I'll do the best that I can as long as I hear and I'm here. And I said, I know that. And no one or few have been any more supportive in my cancer journey than Kirk. And I consider him a, uh, a dear friend forever. Steve, you always say that a measure of a player is their intestinal fortitude. Standing up to Kirk Gibson when he's mad, would you say that's pretty up there? Yeah, that's that's setting the bar kind of, kind of high. Um, you know, if you can stand up to Kirk, because Kirk was a very intense player, as, as everybody knows, throughout his career and, and what he brought to the table. And Fred and I, we do have another thing in common. We will ever be linked to Mike Piazza in one way or another. And I do know his power. So, <laughs> as Fred said, and it's... <laughs> <laughs> oh, we all man, come we all, we all come together for a reason uh fred uh the reason we created this series as far as talking about people's chosen journeys life journeys having people the listeners think about their own journeys and their paths inspire them to find their their chosen lives uh my friend don't know anybody that has fought harder uh recovered from more dusted themselves off and kept running your inspiration to society. If the world was filled with Fred Claire's would be a better place today. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time, sharing your stories. It's been an ultra pleasure. And let's, um, I appreciate those words and let's stay in touch and um, life goes on and uh, we will definitely uh, stay in contact. I will share all the contact information and we have a new set of friends all over again. Take good care yeah, of Fred, it's it's been an it's been an honor to spend this last hour and 15 minutes with you and, and hear the stories and and get to know you a little bit. Uh, I wish we would have crossed paths uh, early in our careers and, and the way it sounded on here. I wish I would have been able to play for for a team that you were the general manager of. But uh, again, let's stay in touch and absolutely 
uh, an honor to, uh, to have this discussion with you. Thank, thank you very much, Steve. Take good care. And anytime I can be of help to you, uh, you've got my number. Thank you. Take care, gents. Take care, guys. Thank you, everyone. All right.